The Behind the Book Lecture Series is made possible by World eBook Library, the world's largest database of portable eBooks for academic research, and the World Heritage Encyclopedia, the world's knowledge at your fingertips. The groundwork of the metaphysics of morals has never not been famous. It was an immediate success. We have the ability to choose what is right and what is wrong. To understand how we have that ability and the implications of that ability is what the groundwork sets out. Immanuel Kant, German philosopher, born in 1724. He was born in what's now a part of Russia. You know, it was called Konigsberg at the time. It's Kaliningrad now. He was a gifted scholar at a young age. Grew up, successful teacher, popular. He was famous in his day uh, for being a bit obsessive about routine. Kant would take long walks every day. And he was so consistent in his walks that people could actually set their clocks by his walks. He was not, I know, very good at dealing with women. He never married. He would socialize, he'd go to parties, so he wasn't like a hermit. But he also doesn't seem to have vested himself in any really like long-term relationships that people will talk about. He loved nothing more than sitting around and thinking. He was probably a relatively content academic. And then, early to mid 50s, he just came out with these massive works of philosophy. They're called the Critiques. And the first one, The Critique of Pure Reason, is a book. It's like this thick. I mean, it's huge. Where did this come from? What happened is that there was this growing intellectual movement of empiricism and skepticism. The charge led most prominently perhaps by a man named David Hume, who argued that really we cannot know anything as human beings because we only know the world through our own senses, our own perceptions, which are by nature subjective and fallible. It was philosophically hard to explain why we could trust our own reasoning. When he read the philosophy of David Hume, what he says is it awakened him from his dogmatic slumber. And in some sense, I think what happened is that he had this fire lit under him and he saw this threat to philosophy and even just our conception of ourselves. He then devoted the remainder of his life to setting out an alternative vision and philosophy for what he thought human reason and human life was. I think I first read Kant probably in high school. I was taking some course and I didn't notice it much. Just kind of something I had to read. Read it again as an undergraduate. And I remember being really skeptical and thinking, wow, this, this Kant guy, he wasn't, he wasn't very bright, you know, and the kind of arrogance that you often have as an undergraduate. Came back to it as a graduate student. I was fortunate to have a fantastic professor who just unlocked it. Kant begins by defining three areas of inquiry. The first, logic. Logic exists unto itself. To be logical, you don't need to base your thinking on any experience. You just need to develop a coherent thought system. And then there were physics, natural sciences, and ethics the science of a bringing about good. But on what was morality grounded? What was the logic that undergirded the way we thought about goodness, for instance? Is there anything that you can think of that's good unconditionally, but like health? Well, health may seem like it's good unconditionally, but what if you're healthy, but it allows you to be a really successful mass murderer? You know, like health isn't itself good. And eventually what he comes down to say is the only thing that's really good 
unconditionally, in and of itself, is goodwill, is willing and wanting good for other people. Because even if your good intentions don't pan out, right? You know, you try to save somebody crossing the street and they get hit by a bicycle on the sidewalk instead, right? That intention was still good. Kant recognizes that many times there's a disconnect between our choices and what happens in the world of sense. But he says that, still, that doesn't detract from the goodness of your choice. Whatever I do must flow from a motivation that I would like to be universal in all the world. This is why Kant remains relevant, because that tension between wanting to do good and then accidentally killing somebody, that tears people apart. But Kant at least gives us some kind of mechanism for understanding why that tension exists and why we can both praise the person and hold them responsible at the same time. It's really making the case that human beings aren't just pinballs in the universe. I still come across people that think that we don't have any free will, it's just an illusion, right? Everything is just cause and effect within the universe. Kant does a great job of explaining why people think that way, but then he takes that extra step and say, but that can't be it. Because when it's time for you to decide, are you going to lie to someone? You make a choice for yourself. Kant would come to call the logical undergirding of moral thought the metaphysics of morals. It was sort of like physics. There was a science and a logic to it. Morality, if it were to be stable and trustworthy, must be based on an unchanging moral law as something that he called, very famously, the categorical imperative. You are being metaphysically moral if you act in such a way that you wish everybody in the world acted that way all the time. Treating another person is not a means, but as an end in themselves. Even if society would be better off, it's still wrong to treat them just as instruments for making people happy. Immanuel Kant was one of those guys who seemed truly suited to his calling. Immanuel Kant lived to be 80 years of age, which in his day was very old, but he was publishing well into the final decade of his life. Northern and Western European philosophy was really built upon the framework and the challenges that, that, that Kant identified. Kant's work has been tremendously influential in modern philosophy. The Hunger Games, the whole premise of the Hunger Games is that you take one or two people and you sacrifice them for the greater good of all. The reason we find the idea of the Hunger Games so repugnant is because we have this Kantian belief that you can't do that to people. <laughs> Today, perhaps more than in any age in human history, we need a groundwork in our morality, otherwise we will lose our way. If we don't understand why and how we believe what we do, why and how we define goodness, and in today's chaos of knowledge, we need Kantian fundamentals, categoricals, so that we can be the people that we say we want to become.